Welcome back. In this lecture, we want to focus on defining evidence-based medicine. So let's start out by thinking about the different ways that we know medicine. So when you think of medicine, how do you know it? What's the basis of the way we evaluate the different treatment options? So in the West, we typically develop an explanatory model of disease. So to do this, we have different ways of analyzing and characterizing diseases and disease treatments. So first, there's the clinical experience of the practitioner, right? So this is usually your doctor. After he sees a lot of different patients, then he gets a feel for what works when he's treating them for different disease states. So clinical experience makes a huge difference. The second way we know medicine is through scientific investigations, and that includes animal studies and the like. Finally, we have outcomes research as well, and these are typically human studies that investigate the efficacy of the different treatment strategies. So they're not quite the same as uh, the trials that the FDA would do with the clinical trials, so they're not as rigorous but they can be very promising and show a lot of data regarding those models. So which type of evidence do you find the most convincing? And which one would you trust the most? The clinical experience of your doctor, scientific investigations that you might look up online, those animal studies, or outcomes research? How have other patients fared when they've taken these things? These are all factors that we want to take into account when we're considering a treatment strategy. And then what other factors might influence your decisions on a treatment strategy? For example, would pain make a difference? So what if it was a choice between having a painful procedure or a non-painful one? How about spiritual values or family traditions? How do these affect your decision-making process when you're thinking about your best medical treatment. So in addition to having those three clinical experience, scientific investigations, and outcomes research to help build our explanatory model, we also need to take into account a lot of patient-focused elements as well, such as patient preference, personal values, tradition, authority, and justice to make sure that people have access to medication, right? So if, so if poor people don't have access to a treatment, they obviously are not going to benefit from these three things up here if they can't actually have that treatment. So a lot of factors do go into our medical system. So one main takeaway point then is that there's still great controversy over how to best implement evidence-based medicine. And this field is ever evolving. So there's numerous studies that exist and our healthcare providers may not always be equipped to find the best or the latest information. So being able to build up your own knowledge base is very powerful when it comes to your own medical care. You can go in knowing a lot of things that may help you and your care provider find the best treatment strategy for you. So evidence-based medicine has the potential to provide patients and care providers with the best healthcare options available. It's going to combine the knowledge from the three ways of knowing medicine, our clinical expertise, the scientific investigations, and our outcomes research. It has an emphasis on accountability, and it provides reasoning to justify the treatments. It also helps provide transparency to allow patients to understand all of their treatment options. And this last point is really important. So the main goal of trying to use an approach like this is that you have improved outcomes with any treatment that you might need. So let's take a look at the different types of evidence-based medicine studies that we'll come across throughout the term and which you could start becoming familiar with. They exist in a hierarchical model with the base of the pyramid down here providing only foundational studies that are less informative than at the top of the pyramid. This is going to provide you with the best evidence for effective treatment modalities. So let's take a deeper look at each type of these studies. 
and see how they differ from one another. So let's start even below our pyramid. This one's not even listed. This would be the level of expert opinion. This is the lowest level of acceptable evidence, but in the absence of any research evidence, it may be the best guide available. But you should be very cautious of individual personal bias when you're just hearing expert opinion. So at the base of our pyramid, we start actually at the second one, which are animal studies and other laboratory research. These can be very useful in providing information on the mechanism by which the medication may work and give you some insight on how it may behave in humans. However, this type of data is pretty limited in its scope. Humans are quite different from other animals and studies that are done in test tubes don't replicate the complex environment that's present inside the human body. So a drug molecule that works well in a test tube may not even be able to reach the right tissue when it, you put it into the human body, and it might not be effective at all. So you have to be careful if there are only animal studies or laboratory research available about a treatment strategy. The next level up are case studies or case series, which typically analyze a series of people with a disease. However, these studies don't have a comparison group to evaluate the data against. Thus, things like the placebo effect cannot be ruled out, and personal bias can also come into play when evaluating these results. So this is why it's lower on our pyramid. Next are the case control studies. And these differ from case series and case studies in that these are generally retrospective studies where patients that already have a condition or outcome that has happened due to a treatment strategy, they're going to be compared with people that do not have the condition or the outcome. And so these types of studies often rely on patient recall and medical records, which are often incomplete, or they have some misconceptions based on incomplete memory of the situation. So they're not the best studies, and they're kind of in the middle of the pyramid. So cohort studies fare better than case control studies. In cohort studies, the researchers are going to follow a group of people known as a cohort, and then they see how events that happen differ among the group and lead to different outcomes. For example, you might follow a cohort of people to see how the influence of smoking or alcohol consumption occur over time and affect their health. So these are typically forward-moving studies rather than retrospective studies, and they tend to have higher accuracy and have more reliability. So we'll discuss some cohort studies throughout the term. These are a little bit stronger data. Next, we see the prospective blind comparisons. And specifically, these are going to evaluate the efficacy of diagnostic tests against a gold standard test. For example, you might compare the reliability of COVID rapid tests against the gold standard of the PCR-based tests for accuracy and reliability. So these ones are just for the diagnostics. They're not for therapeutic treatments. But these types of studies are very useful for diagnostic testing. And so we'll see these throughout the term as well. So you want to look for these if you're looking at diagnostics. So if you're wanting to evaluate therapeutic studies and treatment evaluation, oftentimes the best type of study is a randomized controlled trial or an RCT. So randomized controlled trials test the efficacy of a treatment by randomly assigning participants to two or more groups. One of the groups serves as a control group and is usually receiving a placebo treatment if possible. In addition, the investigators are typically blinded so that they do not know which participants are in which group until after the study is completed. This keeps them from adding unintended bias into the data set. So when you're looking for good research studies about medical treatments, the randomized controlled trials can provide some of the strongest data sets that you'll find. And this one is up near the top of our pyramid. The last two types of studies are really studies about studies. And so what do I mean by that? With the systematic reviews, these usually gather together a bunch of randomized control studies that have been done over a topic 
and they review all of the data supporting a treatment strategy. The meta-analysis above here goes one step further and has the bonus of using statistical analysis to evaluate that data. So the meta-analysis papers sit at the very top of our pyramid for experimental evidence. And over the term, we're going to gain some practice in recognizing and evaluating these different types of studies that provide evidence about treatment strategies. So let's end this section by talking about a model of how we can use evidence-based medicine. We can think of it a little bit like a wheel, where we start with the patient's dilemma. So this can be taken from the viewpoint of a medical practitioner if they're helping a patient, or they can be investigated by the patient themselves when they're trying to figure out the best treatment path for themselves. So first, you want to start off by asking a focused clinical question. This is going to help you narrow down your search parameters and better enable you to retrieve pertinent information. Next, you want to use this question to help acquire the appropriate evidence for your search. Once you've acquired the appropriate studies, you then want to appraise the quality of the evidence in those studies. You want to check and make sure that they have validity. This involves a critical eye that we'll try to develop throughout the term. My motto is always to ask, how do they know that? If a researcher or vendors make a claim about a product, you should always ask, how do they know that's true? What evidence is there to support that claim and how strong is it? So that's why you need to acquire the appropriate evidence to help you answer these questions. Once you've critically evaluated the data and you say, okay, this is something that I want to try, or if you're a practitioner that you want to give to a patient, you can move to the application phase. So if you're the patient, you might go to your family practitioner with some very well-informed questions and information to be sure that you're getting the best quality care. You want to ask about these different products and what they think about you taking them. And then once you decide to apply a technique or a dietary supplement, or maybe you're going to add exercise or change the nutrition uh, that you have in your diet, you want to be able to assess your progress. Is the treatment effective? Am I feeling better? How is my energy feeling? Or it can be other diagnostic testing that shows improvement, such as is my cholesterol actually lower after I've been taking this dietary supplement for a while? So assessing is very important because it allows you to come back and address whether you're actively meeting the needs of the patient. And if the patient is you, you definitely want this to be a positive effect. So along this process, there's a lot of important steps to be sure that we acquire the best information that's out there. The first step is to ask good, focused questions. These require emphasis on both the background and the foreground. So the background is going to look at basic concepts and some textbook learning about the disease state and maybe some of the known treatment strategy. The foreground is going to really focus on the specifics of the patient. So this could be yourself if you're investigating your own healthcare options. So let's take the example of migraine headaches. One background question would be what causes migraines? So you might do some searching and find some basic concepts and do a little bit of textbook learning about the subject. Asking well thought out questions can be challenging. Take a look at the two questions here that are focused on migraines. The first one, what are the best treatments for migraine versus in pregnant women, is acupuncture better or safer than other drugs at reducing migraine frequency or severity? You can see in the second example that this is a much better thought out question. It's very focused and it's going to give you a lot more focused search results when you're looking for the data to support this, right? Versus this one is going to be very vague and it's going to give you a lot of information maybe too much information. So getting good background information is important, but also applying it to the foreground is also important. This is going to depend on the patient's specifics and preferences. 
So you want to be as specific as possible. And you'll have the specific topic, interventions of interest, outcomes of interest that you're going to need to think about. So maybe you're a person that doesn't like to take medication. Your favorite treatment options might be acupuncture or exercise or physical therapy. Thus, medicine can be tailored to individuals and it doesn't have to be a one-size-fits-all approach. So in forming good foreground questions, you want to take four items into consideration. You want to take the patient into consideration. Who is the medication going to be for or the treatment strategy? What is the intervention that you want to find evidence for? What's the comparison that you want to make it to? And then what outcomes do you want to see? For example, if you're wondering about the utility of ginger to help with nausea during pregnancy, you could construct a foreground question like this. In pregnant women, is ginger compared to no ginger or other antiemetics effective at reduced severity of nausea and or vomiting? So this would be a good way to try to construct a good foreground question. Foreground questions also vary depending on the type that you're looking at. So this will help you determine what evidence that you should also look for when searching for the literature. So for example, uh, therapy questions might come up a lot. You want to find a new treatment strategy for some, uh, something that's bothering you. So in this case, you're going to be comparing two different drug treatments or a treatment with a placebo control. And the randomized control trials or the two above it on the pyramid are going to be the gold standards, the systematic reviews and the meta-analysis if they're available. If you don't have these uh, readily available, then you drop down a little bit lower on the pyramid. But note, the lower you go on the pyramid, it's not going to give you a strong of data to support using it as a treatment. However, you might be looking at finding a diagnostic tool to help you evaluate whether or not you have a disease. And so for this, this you want to be able to test the sensitivity and the specificity of that diagnostic test for whatever you want to compare. Uh, for example, I'm getting to the age where they're asking me to go have a colonoscopy and that doesn't sit well with me. So I want to see, you know, how well does Cologuard work versus a colonoscopy where the colonoscopy is the gold standard and the test that I want to look at is the Cologuard test that is not so invasive or painful. So I want to look for prospective blind comparisons that are going to show me you know, is this test as good as the colonoscopy? And if it's not, what are the weaknesses for it? You might also look for studies on risk or harm. These will generally be randomized control trials or cohort studies that you might be looking at. So maybe you're interested in finding out about how alcohol consumption affects liver function in older adults, right? This is going to be an ideology or a harm you know, what's the risk of developing a condition if I do this? And finally, you might be interested in prognosis. These are often covered by cohort studies or case control studies. So overall, you need to take into account the types of foreground questions that you're asking to search for the most relevant data. The other consideration is knowing where you can find these studies. PubMed is probably the most popular database to look for health data. But Google Scholar and the Cochrane Reviews are great too. So feel free to investigate the different places for searching for data. However, care has to be taken that you're using original studies to find your data and evidence. Don't be satisfied with blogs or product marketing pages that have a vested interest in making their product seem like it's the best ever. You want to be able to access the best studies possible to give you a clear understanding about the treatment. It's not always possible, though, as our knowledge about certain treatments may be limited. But don't be satisfied with statements that don't have the data to back them up. Remember to always be asking, how do they know that? What's the data that shows it? 
So once you've found the evidence, it's time to appraise it. Be critical in your reading. Many studies on dietary supplements or alternative treatments and modalities have small sample sizes and are only done for a short time frame. Or they may not have adequate controls or blinding as part of their collection process. So make sure that you have your bullshit detector in good working order. We're going to discuss some more common marketing strategies that are meant to draw you in later during the term. And we will um, get your bullshit detector all full and working well. So when you get ready to apply any practices into your own health regime, it's always a good idea to seek advice from your family doctor and be sure to assess your outcomes as you progress. Are you seeing the outcomes that you desire? Overall, you want to be an informed consumer and obtain the best health care possible. All right then, that's an introduction into some of the key elements of evidence-based medicine.